I want to talk to you about a miracle. A miracle that is described by all four gospel writers. The great discourse on the bread of life. Virginia asked me yesterday, she said, um, what are you going to preach about tomorrow? I said, food. She said, not again. I said, no, not really, literally. I said, I'm going to talk about the bread of life. And she said, oh, whew, we're safe. She said, um, I know how I can get you to stop talking about food in service. I said, how? She said, have a donut before church. And I was like, ugh. The lessons, I am the bread of life. Church, this morning we can say as factual truth, he is the bread of life. Amen? Amen. But that's not exactly, totally what I wanted to focus on this morning. The part of the miracle I want to focus on this morning, the, the connection of this miracle are three people. So starting in John chapter 1, or John chapter 6, verse 1, there we go, don't want to get anybody lost, I I don't have problems doing that myself, I wake up in the morning sometimes I get lost. (laughs) After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which was the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And thus he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus already had the answer, but he's asking a question. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient enough for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? They're scrambling. They're trying to figure out what to do. How many of us in our lifetime have found ourselves in a pinch and we're trying to scramble to figure out what to do? I've been there. I've tried to scramble. I've tried to figure out what I need to do. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there were as much, there was much grass in this place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, filled the twelve baskets with the fragments and the five barley loaves, which remained, over and above unto them that had eaten. Then the men rose, excuse me, then those men, when they had seen this miracle, Jesus did. He said, this is the truth of the prophet that shall come to the world. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you, Lord, for this miracle Father, may this miracle teach us lessons, Father, about our lives. And we'll give you the praise, Jesus' name. 
Now, I told you this was a story about a miracle. And the miracle was that Jesus took five barley loaves and two fish, and he fed 5,000. But I want to dig a little deeper into this miracle. I want to dig into your lives. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I really wish you wouldn't. I can see it in your faces right now. <laughs> I want us to concentrate on three people in connection with this miracle. Philip, Andrew, and the little boy. You see, because all of them play a very important part of this miracle. Now we see in verses 5 through 7 that Philip was figuring out on the least. When shall we buy bread that would, we can feed all these people? Where are we going to go get this kind of bread? There's no town that's really close enough that has a bakery big enough to feed them all. I know what the problem was. The people didn't read the memo. They forgot to bring their own lunches. They forgot that they were going to be far away from town and they, they forgot the memo and, and so now they forgot how long this camp meeting was going to be and so now they're stuck with no food. When Jesus asked Philip where they could get a great amount of bread, Philip started assessing the probable cost. When we get into a fix or a situation, we start trying to figure out the probable cost to fix the problem. Jesus wanted to teach him that financial resources are not the most important ones. You see, church, so many times we focus on what we think is important and we forget that Jesus is the provider. We forget that Jesus has already figured out our problem. We just need to go to him for the answer. Too many times we're trying to figure it out ourselves. We see here that Philip was trying to figure it out. When the solution was right in front, what Jesus even said right there, he already knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew this little boy was going to show up with five barley loaves and two fish. I think his mother was very smart. She had, he had a smart mother. He knew he was going to be out amongst this crowd, and he knew little boys are like they are. I remember being little once, and I couldn't wait to run home when mom wasn't there to snatch a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a big glass of milk and gobble it down and go back out and play. And then I knew it was going to just be a short time for lunch. And she'd be calling us back for lunch. You see, this little boy, he left home and he had his fish and he had his bread. But notice what Jesus did with the bread. The same thing he did when he partook of communion with the disciples. What did he do? He broke it and gave thanks. You see, so many times, church, we need to remember who we need to give thanks to. God knows how important we can be. See, I think we can limit God or what God does by assuming that we that he can't do it. We ask God to do things. Oh, I'm not going to ask God to do that. He can't do that. That's not possible. But we see in Scripture that all things are possible. To who? To them that what? Wait upon the Lord. You see... You know what the problem with us are? We don't know how to wait. We don't know how to wait. Why? What are you saying, Pastor? I know how to wait. No, you don't. You see, because if we wait upon the Lord, he'll bring the right answer. Sometimes we think that answer needs to be like right now, instantaneous. We need a solution to our problem. But that's not always the case. The solution, the answer doesn't always come instantaneously. We can identify with this problem because this is a problem with daily bread. Some are, how do we say, some are surprised 
that Christians have problems. Did you know that? Do you know people are surprised when you have a problem? Wait a minute, doesn't he go to church? Isn't he a Christian? See, people see you as this. People see Christians as this. They get on a happy face, and they go into the world, and everything is perfect. No problems. Everything is hunky-dory. If you could say such a word. Those Christians are all happy. They're living the good life. You see, the world is deceived. See, we have problems. We go through trials and tribulations. Unlike theirs. See, the, the gift we have is we have Jesus. See, we go through our problems and we have somebody who's going to solve our problems. Who's already brought the answer. See, I want you to note here that Jesus saw the problem long before Philip. As I have said so many, many times from this pulpit, nothing takes Jesus by surprise. Nothing. Even if you got up this morning and you kicked that little bedpost with your toe and you started jumping around, Jesus knew it was going to happen. You're like, well, if he knew it was going to happen, then why didn't he put something down there softer so I wouldn't hurt my toe? I think he just wanted to see you dance around, what kind of new dance you had going on. You grab that foot and you start hopping around. But what the word says that he was going to prove Philip. Jesus knew what to do all the time. But Philip was trying to figure it out. Let every one of them take him a little. See, many see a problem and they focus on the problem. They focus on them. Focusing on the problem limits the horizon. You're limiting what God can do when you begin to focus on what you need to do. Instead of what Jesus can do. You see, he should have focused on God's power as opposed to trying to figure out how much money he was going to need and where he was going to have to go to get the bread that he needed to feed all the people. Your problem is, take your focus off of your problems. Trust God. Because when you begin to trust God with the problems, he's going to help you to focus on him and not the problem. He's going to solve it for you. I think that's why so many Christians live so far below their potential. I don't mean to say that rudely. But I think we live below our potential because... I don't think we trust God like we're supposed to. I don't think we trust Jesus. I think if Philip trusted Jesus wholeheartedly in, in all manner of his life, he wouldn't have been trying to figure out the problem because he would have known the problem was already solved. Your problem is already solved. You're just waiting for the manifestation of what's going to happen. But we see Andrew was a finder. I want you to picture yourself as an Andrew today. Right after coming to Jesus, right after he found him, what did he do? He went and found Peter. And he introduced Peter to Jesus. In John 1, 40 and 41, one of those two which heard John speak after him, and Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, he first findeth his brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which being interpreted, the Christ. So he goes and he finds, he says, look, we found the Christ. So he, he goes and he finds other people. Often those who are newly converted are the best finders. Those people who come to Christ for the first time are the best finders. I've told you my testimony when, when I came to Jesus for the first time. Man, I was so on fire. I mean, I couldn't wait to go home and tell my mom and my brothers and sisters that I found the Messiah. 
I found Jesus. And I asked him into my heart, my life. I remember going home and I was all excited. And I was telling mom that I'd gone to church and I found Jesus. And, and, and you know, he, he's available for everybody. And she's like, okay, okay. I said, mom, but if you don't, if, 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 if you don't change your ways, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> Not a good witnessing practice. Not to the mother. She said, excuse me? Oops. But I was excited. I was wanting people to know the Jesus that I just found. I wanted everybody to know him. Maybe if you thought back just for a moment, you could remember when you were a finder. Do you remember when you could not wait to share Jesus with everybody that you came in contact with? Better yet, the question should be this morning, do you still have that passion? Do you still have that desire to get out there and share with people who Jesus is? I still use our little track pens. I can't wait to tell people that Jesus loves them. And I say, here, here, take this, this free, take it. It'll remind you that Jesus loves you. Every time somebody, see, I used to give out these other little things, but people would throw them away. It didn't take me long to figure out that people always keep a pen. Somebody always wants a pen somewhere. When people come into Regal Paints, I have a little canister right there, right on the counter. They go, oh, can I use that pen? I said, better yet, you can have it. Because Jesus made it available for you. And they look at it and they're like, oh, this is really cool. And I can say, Jesus loves you. You see, people need to be reminded that Jesus loves them. People need to be reminded that Jesus died for them. Do you have that desire this morning? Does that passion still burn in you this morning to share with others that Jesus loves them? Andrew didn't rule out any possibilities. The lunch was a small thing, but he reported it. You see, the small things in our life are, are significant. Sometimes we pray for things. Sometimes there are things that you should be praying about and you're not. Because you say, oh, that's insignificant. Like stubbing that toe on the bed. What seems insignificant to you is awesome to God. Because it brings you to talk to him. So don't think about how small or insignificant the prayer may be because God wants to hear from you. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot this morning. I don't want you to raise your hand. But how many talked to God this morning? How many got up and talked to him this morning? Or you got up and said, well, I, got, I hope Pastor brings me a good word this morning, something I can chew on for a few days or a week or whatever it may be. How about did you get up this morning and Read the word. How did you get up this morning and say, good morning, Jesus. I love you. No, most of us got up this morning and said, oh, these knees, these elbows, these eyeballs. Well, who made it so bright outside? Jesus, did you turn the air condition on? Because I got to go outside. I don't want to sweat. You know, we're too busy complaining instead of thanking. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful day. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm going to get to go to church and I'm going to get to fellowship with all those who show up this morning. I'm going to get to have a time of fellowship after church. On top of that, Jesus, the most of all, the biggest blessing is I'm going to get to hear from you today. 
But see, you get to hear from Jesus every day, not just Sunday morning. Every time you open the Word of God, every time you begin to doubt things in your life or you begin to have these down days, you need to start looking into the Word of God because the Word of God brings joy and peace. Sometimes even laughter. Joy is a merry medicine. I'm going to give you a little remedy for in the morning when you get up. You want to feel better in the morning when you get up? Do this. Sit up in the bed and just start laughing. Right? Laughter is a merry medicine. It makes you happy. It brings joy into your life. So when you sit up, don't complain about the knees. Just start laughing. Think of something, just start laughing. I can do that sometimes. I try to laugh softly because I don't want to wake Virginia up. I can get up and I'd sit up in the morning and what I think of sometimes is I think of a baboon with his tongue sticking out at me. And it makes me laugh. You see, there are things you can do that will make you laugh. And it's a, it, it's a merry medicine. It makes, it makes your day happier. Look at the smiles on your faces already. Just thinking of a baboon sticking his tongue out at you. See how easy that was? Just that simple. Elijah only needed a cloud the size of a man's hand to bring rain. If you don't believe me, I want to invite you to read 1 Kings chapter 18. Because this is not something I made up. This is something that is factual in the Word of God. Take time to read it. Whatever you have is enough for Jesus to use. Whatever you have is enough. But let's talk about verses 10 through 14. You see, verses 10 through 14 talks about a little boy who gave all he had. If I was to tell you this morning that you need to leave church, and you need to sell all you have and give it to the Lord, you'd say, that man is crazy. But this little boy had five barley loaves and two fish, and towering over him is a disciple who says, we need your lunch. Now, if I was a little kid, and my mom packed me a lunch, and somebody was towering over me and said, I want your lunch, I would probably kick him in the shin and run because this is my food. So many times, church, we do that to Jesus. He's given us something or he wants to use something, but yet we aren't willing to give it to him. We kick him in the shin and run. No, it's mine. But we don't fail to stop to understand that Jesus gave it to us to begin with. So it belongs to him. So give it back to him. I look at this struggle that precedes surrender. You know there's a struggle that precedes surrender. How many have found it difficult to surrender some things in your life? I'm one. I wore this particular color this morning for a reason. I wanted you to know that as we spoke on this topic, that everything is going to be peachy. <laughs> everything works out. See, people don't like to think that problems go away so easy. But they can. You see, I want to think of the unrecorded part of this miracle. The struggle that came when he was called upon to give up his lunch. The struggle that called for the concerns of others. The struggle that called for faith. The disciples needed to learn faith. They were 
told to have all the men to sit down. Now, if another guy told you to sit down, what would be the first thing out of your mouth? Come on, be honest with me. Why? Right? Why? If I said because Jesus said so, you'd sit down. If I said because I need you to, you'd probably say no. Or I don't want to. Or I don't think it's necessary. But they had all the men to sit down. I just can only imagine. Think of this for a moment. This little boy who gave up his lunch. Think about him for a moment. Think about this. He's fixing to watch the greatest miracle he probably has ever seen in his whole life and ever, ever would have seen again. Jesus gathers up some baskets and he puts these loaves in the baskets. And next thing you know, these disciples are handing out bread to everyone. It's a smorgasbord. That guy, that little kid's eyes had to be like this. They had to be huge. He's watching his bread being multiplied over and over and over and over where everybody got to eat their fill. And it wasn't just the bread, but the fish. Everybody was eating fish. It was a big fish fry. Everybody's having fish, all that they want. But the greatest miracle of all was this. In that passage of scripture, what did Jesus tell them to do? He said, gather up all the morsels. Put them back into the basket that nothing would be wasted, including the five barley loaves. What does that tell you? That those barley loaves never got touched. Isn't that awesome? A demonstration of a true man. The, that, that little boy's lunch didn't get eaten by anybody. It was put back into the basket, the same as his fish. The little boy brought five barley loaves and two fish. Guess what he left with? Five barley loaves and two fish. That is a miracle. You see, when we begin to think of the, the overwhelming possibilities of what Jesus can do, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's some of us, we can't even wrap our minds around it. But this little boy got to see one of the greatest miracles. The, 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 the food that was distributed, the people that were satisfied, and the little boy that had joy. Because he was a part of the miracle. You see, church, you're a part of a miracle. It's a miracle that you're here this morning. It's a miracle that you've given your life to, to Christ because the world is vying for everything that you have. They want to, the, Satan wants your soul. He wants your life. He wants everything you have. And he's trying to rob, kill, and destroy you every day. But you know what the great miracle is? That you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And because you serve him, he watches over you. You're able to get up in the morning and put on the full armor of God. And you're able to go out into the world and, 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 and the enemy, he can't take you down. Because you have the greatest thing of all. You have the Lord Jesus Christ to walk with you, to talk with you, to give you guidance, to give you understanding when you need understanding. To give you wisdom when you need wisdom. How many need wisdom? The word of God says he gives it freely to those who ask. Another free gift. Salvation's a free gift. Wisdom is a free gift. All you have to do is ask for it. But how many of us ask for wisdom? You see, I have figured it out a long time ago. And I'm so thankful that I have a wife to help me to figure it out. You cannot lose when you give it all to Jesus. 
You can't lose. You can't lose because you know what? It was all his to begin with. You see, church, when we surrender what we think is ours back to the king, it's used and it's multiplied for greater blessings. This morning, we're going to receive a second offering. And that second offering is for us to bless others. As I was sharing with you a couple of weeks ago and just touched on it last week, we get a lot of phone calls throughout the week, especially since the economy has gone berserk. Inflation is at an all-time high. And we got all these things going on. And people need help. And they've been, they've been calling us. And I, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. I said, look, we're a small church. I can't pay your light bill. I can't pay your what? And I certainly can't pay your rent. You ever seen rent prices? We can't do that. But we do have a little that we can help you with. And so Virginia and I, we give out these little $25 gift cards to Publix or Aldi's or Walmart, you know. And we, when they call, we'd, I'd meet them and, I, and I'd give them one. It'd help them with a couple meals, but I'd also, I'd give them a little piece of paper with it. And it has phone numbers of different agencies that they can get in touch with to help with their other needs. You see, I don't believe you can just give a little and just send them on their way. It doesn't help. But if you give them information, you give them a little, you impart a little knowledge to them, it will help them to maneuver to what they really need. But sometimes I'll, I'll, they may need just a little gas and I'll they get them $20 worth of gas or a, a food gift card so that they can get a couple meals while they get in touch with an agency that can help them out. I know that Legacy, a couple times a month, they give out food. And so I, I let them know about that. As I told you, one lady that I had talked to really kind of shocked me. She said she had gone to our church, and it's a mega church. And she went to them for help, and they said they couldn't help her. They didn't have any money. I was stunned. But listen, church, we're not a big church. And I'm only asking for your help to do what you can do to help us help them. And it doesn't have to be just this one-time thing. Maybe once a month you might want to get a, when you're out at the grocery store or something, or Aldi's or Walmart or whatever, and pick up a little $25 gift card and drop it in the offering. That's fine. You can get giving credit for that too. I don't know if you knew that, but you can get giving credit for that because it's helping the ministry. But church, I just want us to be able to try to help when people call to help. I want to be able to say to them that Jesus loves you. And when I give it to them, say, Jesus, bless you. Because that's who the card is coming from. It's not coming from us. It's coming from God. And we got to do what we can do to help those who are in need. We're supposed to. But I just, like I said, I can't give away the store. <laughs> so they say. My board might have my head. <laughs> but, but we can do a little. Amen? Amen? Like I said, we can't pay rent. We can't pay light bills, water bills. But we can help with small things. And we can give them information to get them on the right track. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us the opportunity and the privilege, Father, to help those who are less fortunate, those who are in need. Father, I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to be like the little boy with the five loaves and the two fish. Father, he gave it up so he could help. Lord, I pray this morning, may our heart be the same way. May we do it so we can help feed 5,000. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.